there's a picture of the uh, unit circle with um, hopefully you guys can see it may it may take a second to come in. But uh, even if, if you can't see it, just Google unit circle literally like they're they all it's all going to be the same thing. It's going to be those common angle measures um, and then the, the coordinate points that they correspond to. <clears throat> and you might find a better picture. I noticed this one when I click on it, it something's wrong with this picture. I don't know. Maybe you can find a better one. OK. So we had that idea. <clears throat> that for this coordinate point, the uh, the corresponding values cosine of T gives you the X value and sine of T gives you the Y value. Also, let's just quickly recall that all of the trig function, the other trig functions can be written in terms of X and Y values or really in terms of sines and cosines. So let's just let me remind you of that. The tangent of T is equal to y over x, which really I can describe in case I haven't made this explicitly uh, known yet. Tangent of t can be considered as sine of t over cosine of t, a ratio of those two trig functions. It can be written in tangent t can be written in terms of sine and, and sine and cosine. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, we have cosecant of t which is equal to one over y, and it can literally be written in terms of a sine function, one over sine t, one over sine t, one over y, like literally lining up y, you know, if y is there, then it's one over sine t is equal to y, so it's one over sine t. And then we have secant of t, which is equal to one over x, which again can be written in terms of sines and cosines. Well, specifically cosine, right? Cosine of t, one over cosine of t. <clears throat> and then finally, cotangent of t can be written in terms of, uh, now this is equal to x over y, right? And this can be written in terms of tangent. It can be one over tangent, but it's also just the same as the reciprocal of tangent, which would be cosine over sine. All right, so why am I saying all this? Well, because we're going to start off mainly graphing sines and cosine. Pretty much this entire section, I believe, is about just graphing sine and cosine graphs because all of the other functions can be written in terms of the, it doesn't mean their graphs are going to look the same. These graphs look very different from sine and cosine, but they are related. OK. <clears throat> OK. So how do we get to a graph of uh, how do we get to a graph of let's say cosine T? Oops, how do we graph X equals cosine of T? Well, I'm going to do something a bit weird here where for each of these functions, as we talk about graphing them, I'm going to make the x, this this side of the equation, either x for cosine, y for sine, y over x, one, uh, this stuff in terms of x's and y's, I'm going to make that the vertical axis, which is going to seem very weird to you because you're used to always seeing y as the vertical axis, right? But in this case, cosine of t, the output is an x value, right? And we like to graph our functions in terms of inputs on the horizontal axis and outputs on the vertical axis. And for cosine, it's, it's just, it, this is what cosine does, right? On the unit circle, you input some arc length slash angle, right? Really it's a, an angle and it outputs some x value on the unit circle. So I'm going to graph this on a plane. With outputs x and inputs t. 
outputs X and inputs T. <clears throat> okay. So let's make a table of values, right? That's the standard way to, to graph a function. So for T values, T values, let's say um, starting at zero. Now what T values am I gonna pick? I'm gonna pick, let's say, some nice angles, right? But which ones are the nicest? How about uh, T equals zero, uh, pi on two, um, pi, three pi on two, and two pi. Now I'm gonna show you a picture now, cause you know there's more angles in between each of these, right? There's like pi on six, pi on four, pi on three, and then there's angles between here and here. But these are the nice ones that on the unit circle land me on an axis, right? So at T equals zero, what is the X value? What is the X value of the coordinate point? In other words, where cosine is uh, when you input T into cosine, what does it give you? So you look at your unit circle and you say, okay, when T is zero, meaning the arc length, that angle is zero, what is the X value? The X value is one. <clears throat> now, what about when T is pi on two? So T is pi on two on the, on the unit circle. When T is pi on two, that's a 90 degree angle landing us on this positive Y axis. So, uh, uh, Haley, what would the x? What is the x value here on the positive y axis? Bailey, how about? Uh, Braden, what would the x value be on the positive y axis for a t value of pi on 2? Yes, it's 0 up here at 0. And if we look at that unit circle, we see that. Yes, it is 0. Good. OK. And then over at pi, rather on this picture at t, uh, at pi, that's a 180 angle. We're over here where the x value is negative one. And then three pi on two, we're back at zero. And then two pi puts us all the way back around at one. So these coordinate points, so my t values, let me graph these. My t values are in terms of, you know, radian measures, pi on two, here's pi, here's three pi on two. So that's pi on two, pi, three pi on two, and two pi. <clears throat> oh, and then what are the output possible outputs here? The possible outputs are one, zero, and negative one. So I'll put a one up here and a negative one down here. Okay, so at t equals zero, the x value is one. And remember, x is measuring the vertical axis here, right? At t equals pi on two, we're at zero. At t equals pi, we're at negative one. And at t equals three pi on two, we're at zero, back at zero. And then at t equals two pi, we're back at one. So I'm getting this sort of general shape, and it is curved. It is curved like that. That sort of general shape. Now, we know there's gonna be more to this graph because uh, we know that you can keep going with the t values, right? The t values go on forever this way and they go on forever in the negative direction. So what other, uh, what is the rest of this graph gonna look like? So <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen, go to a graphing calculator so you can see, <clears throat> uh, by the way, this is the page that came up when I Googled unit circle, right? So you can see there's tons of them. They all say the same thing. Actually, I need to give me one second. I'm going to pull up some. Oh, please tell me I did it for cosine. I already built some tables of values in Desmos, so. Uh-oh. 
go. Hang on, something's going wrong with my graph here. There it is. All right. So over here on the left, if you if you see this table here, I made a table of values with those other special angles in between. So I've got my zero, my pi on two, the ones that I graphed by hand, the pi, the three pi on two, and the two pi. But also I graphed all those angles in between, right? The pi's on six, pi's on fours, and pi's on threes. And these green dots are what I got, okay? So there you can see that's one period of the cosine graph. That's one period of the cosine graph. Then I went further and I said, where is it? I said, let me make another rotation around the unit circle. So instead of starting at zero and going to two pi, I'm gonna start at two pi and go to four pi. 2 pi to 4 pi. In other words, I'm just taking these values, the same exact values from my table up above and adding two pi, a whole rotation to them, right? And that's how I got these red dots, these red dots. This is the next rotation around the unit circle. Now, what if I say, let me just sum it all up with an infinite rotation in either direction. And by the way, what would it look like in a... negative direction, well, I would be subtracting 2 pi, right? So these blue dots are where I'm going and I'm uh, rotating clockwise in sense. Where's the blue values? Here we go. So I'm taking those base values, 0, pi on 2, etc., and all the angles in between, but I'm subtracting 2 pi. I'm going in the reverse direction now. So I'm, I'm graphing negative angles, negative angles here. And it just goes in the opposite direction. So what I have here, what I would call this, let me get it, hang on, let me, there we go. What I have here is th three periods of the cosine of T graph, three periods, okay? A negative one, kind of the standard first one from zero to two pi, and then another one from two pi to four pi. So I've got negative two pi to zero, zero to two pi, two pi to four pi, of course, if I extend this to include all values, not just not just in between all these little dots, but also infinitely in, in the positive and negative direction, if I just say cosine, I'm gonna have to call it X here because that's what Desmos likes. I can't put T, it'll confuse Desmos. Then this is the graph I get. That purple bold line there has this shape. That's the cosine graph, okay? That's the cosine graph. OK. <clears throat> so what is this a graph of? What is, what is that curly lion looking thing a graph of? It's a graph of the X coordinates along the unit circle, right? Those X coordinates as T increases, you know, as we rotate counterclockwise or count, uh, or clockwise, uh, depending on if we want positive or negative angles, then um, then this at these output values, all these dots that you just saw on the on the graphing thing on the graphing calculator, all those dots are representing all the x values that I would have as I rotated around the unit circle. Some notes about this uh, this graph. Some notes about it. <clears throat> it is periodic. We say it is periodic, meaning it repeats. It's not like a polynomial graph, right? A polynomial graph shoots off to infinity in, uh, you know, in either directions, and it might, it just blows up at some point, right? It, it might like do like a little couple, few little loop things, but then it just, it either extends off to infinity or negative infinity, right? But a, a cosine graph is periodic, meaning it repeats and it has period 
2 pi. That means it repeats every 2 pi. What does that mean? That means that, oh, excuse me, sorry. Cosine of t plus 2n pi is just the same as cosine of t, meaning the outputs are the same when you add or subtract value multiples of 2 pi. So n here, where n is n is just any integer. So n could be like negative 2, so t minus 2 pi, or n could be 10, t plus uh, 20 pi, you know, something like that. Um, let me show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to go to a new graph, new, nice clean, come on. There we go, cosine, cosine, O, oh, just X. There we go. Okay, <clears throat> so for a particular uh, input T, let's just pick T equals zero, then every multiple of two pi, what I'm saying when I say cosine of T plus two M pi is equal to cosine of T has period two pi, that's what this means. What I'm saying is that for every two pi, I should get that exact same output. What's the output when T equals zero? It's one. So when I add two pi to my input over here, I should get one again. If I add another two pi, I should get one again. So every time I add two pi, my output should be the same, and it will be. It'll always be one. If I go the opposite direction, if I subtract two pi, still the same output. Subtract two pi, subtract two pi, still the same output. It has period two pi. <clears throat> so from, so I could literally take this section from zero to two pi, take a picture of it, and literally build the rest of the graph just by copying that over and over to the left and the right. All right. OK, so it has period 2 pi. Great. What else? It is bounded between one and negative one. Did you notice that? It's bounded between one and negative one, which we've pointed out before. But now we see it on a graph where those output values never extended beyond one and negative one, right? They're all squished between one and negative one. Another way to say this is in inequality form. There we go. That's another way to say that. Not saying that the domain is bounded, right? T can be any number you want it to be, but the output is bounded. Literally, the height of the graph is bounded between one and negative one. We also have, you may not have noticed this, but symmetry around the y-axis, like a parabola. It's symmetrical around the y-axis. It's symmetrical around the y-axis. This means, this means cosine of t is, is an even function. Maybe you don't uh, recall what an even function is, uh, but remember for polynomials, we said that if all their exponents were even, then the function is even. But really, it's not that, it's that the that it's symmetric around the y-axis, right? And what does it mean if it's symmetric around the y-axis? It means that if you plug in a negative t value, cosine doesn't care, it just outputs the exact same thing it would for that positive value. So like, if you look at the graph, cosine of uh, negative pi on two is the same for cosine of pi on two. It's an even function. All right. Now, let's build sine of t. All right. How do we graph y equals sine of t? So 
So notice last time I called it X equals cosine of T. Now I'm saying Y equals sine of T because that's exactly what sine of T outputs. When T is an arc length measured along the unit circle, sine of T outputs the Y values at those coordinate points where the arc length is landing at. So when I graph this, I'm going to graph it with a vertical, instead of vertical X axis like I did for cosine, I'm going to graph it with a vertical Y axis. And of course the, the horizontal axis is still T. Here's my little table of values where again, I'm going to pick some very nice values, uh, some very nice angles, zero, pi on two, pi, those like half multiples of pi because they give us very, I don't want to have to try to graph like square roots of two and stuff like that. So that's why I'm picking these again. And then here I have y equals sine of t. So what is the y value on the unit circle where t is equal to zero? It is zero, right? So look at looking at your unit circle, we're looking at the y value at each point on the axis. So now moving to the positive y axis where t is equal to pi on two, we get a one, right? That's the y value at that coordinate point. The next one, moving to the angle pi, so on the negative x axis on that unit circle picture, the y value is zero again. Now we're down at three pi on two where the y value becomes negative one. That's on the negative y axis. And then we come all the way back around starting at zero again uh, for that two pi angle, the y value is, uh, is zero again. Okay, so we have graphing these pi on two, pi, I didn't leave myself enough room, three pi on two and two pi. We'll get a, I'll show you a picture of it in Desmos. So it'll be much nicer. One and negative one. Again, it's bounded between one and negative one. We'll see that. So at t equals zero, the y value is zero. Pi on two, we're up at one. At pi, we're at zero. At three pi on two, we're down here at negative one. And at two pi, we're back at zero. So we're getting this sort of shape. Kind of ignoring those details in between these points, but that is going to be the general shape. <clears throat> so let's look at that. There it is. And maybe I'll also graph cosine of x. First, let's just consider sine. And you know what, really, I'm going to, we had cosine as red before, so let's get this straight here. Okay, all right, there's sine in blue. So you see, I've only graphed the first period of it. I graphed from, on my picture, from t equals zero to t equals two pi. That's this one curve here. But we see that repeats, it repeats over and over again. So it's just like cosine, it's gonna have a period of two pi. What's the difference though? What's really, what's the difference between these two functions? Um, does anyone see, let's see, uh, uh, William, what is, what do you see as a difference between these two functions? What about uh, Ji Cheng? What do you see? What can you point out between the difference between these two uh, function graphs? What do you think? Uh, I see you're unmuted, but I don't hear anything. So uh, maybe you're uh, thinking, but uh, that's okay. Does anyone does anyone have uh, any idea? Like, what can we point out? What's the difference between these two functions? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. 
Yeah, if you want to type out what you see as a difference between them, that's cool too. Does anyone see any difference? I mean, there is a difference, right? Surely we can we can see that. <clears throat> but how can we describe it? OK, it's uh, they're shifted, right? One is one is a shifted version. One is a shifted version of the other, right? Like uh, if I took the cosine graph and I scooted it to the right, if I could just like pull this to the right a bit, then it would it would perfectly line up with the blue graph, the sine graph. Or I could take the sine graph and pull it back uh, a bit and it would perfectly line up with the cosine graph. OK, so let's go to here. Go back to camera and say some facts to note uh, about the graph of sine. It is also periodic with period 2 pi, just like cosine. So that means that sine of t is going to be equal to sine of t plus 2 pi. So those outputs are going to match for any multiple of 2 pi, or sorry, 2 n pi. It's supposed to be 2. I mean, that's true, but to get the entire idea across, it's t plus any multiple of 2 pi. There we go, 2 n pi. It's uh, also bounded, just like cosine. So I'll just sum that up as saying that's just this: that sine of t is bounded between negative one and one, just like uh, just like cosine was, right? It's bounded. Its output is bounded between negative one and one, and we do have a certain symmetry around the not the y-axis. We have symmetry around the origin it's like a mirror image around the origin if you go back and look at the sine graph it's a mirror image around the origin meaning the zero zero point of the graph it's like it's been flipped over and reflected you know so there is symmetry to know it's not the same as cosine and what do we say when something has symmetry around the origin it is it is an odd function and moreover what does that mean in terms of like when you input negatives into it it means if you input a negative into the sine function that's the same as just the negation of whatever that positive input is into the sine function so that why is that useful well that means if you plug in sine of negative three pi on two then you can say well that's just the same as sine of three pi on two and then negating that output OK, uh, what else can I say? Let me talk about how it's related. How, how are they? How are they related? So I said in words that one is just like a horizontally shifted version of the other, but we know how to deal with that because we've taken 112 and we know that um, uh, to talk about horizontally shifting functions, we talk about adding or subtracting stuff inside the function. So I can say How can I describe this? Let me write it in red because this is kind of a big idea. If I take the cosine t graph, so that's the red one. Oh, let me uh, let me share my screen. 
All right, if I take the cosine graph, which is red here, I want to shift it right by pi on two to get it to, oh wait, how do I know pi on two? Well, sorry, I kind of gave that away there, but if I, hmm, let me do something here. Graph the point zero one and label it and graph the point uh, pi on two comma one. And label it, make them both green just to make them easier to look at. OK, <clears throat> so red graph pulled to, to if I want to make these graphs match, if I could just yank this point over here, then they would perfectly match, right? The red graph, if I could take this point along with the rest of the graph and pull it right there, then it would perfectly match. So I want to shift it right by pi on two, because what's the difference here? Zero to pi on two, that's the difference of pi on two, right? So how do I say shift right by pi on two? I say cosine of t minus pi on two, and then that would give me the sine of t graph. So here, if I said cosine, now of course I'm going to have to use <clears throat> x as my input, otherwise Desmos will go crazy. So I'm using, instead of t, I'm using x because Desmos does not like when you use things other than x as input. Um, so here it is. So as I take my cosine graph, uh, the remember the blue graph is sine, and I pull it over, by moving it right by pi on two, look, it perfectly overlaps with the sine graph. Now, similarly, I can say this the opposite way, right? I can say pull sine back by pi on two, so that means shift it left by pi on two, and that'll give me the cosine graph. So it's just two ways to say, uh, you know, either pull cosine right by pi on two or pull sign left by pi on two and you'll get them to match. Okay. All right, so I'm just thinking about what I want to go over next here. So next in my notes, I have that we need to uh, discuss transformations of functions because now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking these sine and cosine graphs and messing with them, right? We're going to be stretching them vertically, horizontally, shifting them, flipping them over the y-axis or x-axis, all sorts of stuff, right? <clears throat> so these are transformations that you may have not recall uh, from 112, but I think instead of explicitly like going over all of them and spending time, I'm just going to type up something that will kind of sum it all up and I'll send it to you as notes in the chat. Like I'll build a PDF and send it to you. So I'm going to say, we'll send notes on transformations of, of functions uh, later. For now, let's just let's just keep going and I'll kind of remind you as we go. And it'll be helpful to look at those notes later to kind of make this stuff make uh, kind of put it all together. <clears throat> so what I'll do is as we go here in in the you know the rest of this lecture, I'll be more uh, vague and, and speak more in like layman's terms about how these transformations are working. And then later, if you want some technicality to attach, um, that's where you'll look for those notes. Something else I need to note here is that the text and hence all homework problems 
and exam problems because the exam problems come from the text. Makes the switch. Even though it's dumb to do this, makes the switch back to. X for the domain variable. And we're going to have to play along with that because we're using WebAssign, which pulls problems straight from the text. And uh, <clears throat> it's just one of those things that we just have to put up with. Um, and why am I making, why do I sound so defeated about this? Well, because the whole point of getting to where we can graph trig functions is to, is to use that T variable, which is a special angle input on the unit circle, right? And X should be specifically assigned to the cosine output function for the, for the sorry, for the output of the cosine function, right? Because it's literally cosine of T is equal to X, the X coordinates on the unit circle. But instead what our book does is it says like, it likes to write them as uh, functions of X for all the trig functions. So now X does not mean what it meant for the past uh, chapter uh, five and section 6.1 and 6.2. X is now just an, uh, an arbitrary domain variable again. So I will try to point that out as we come to it. And uh, I'll try not to like just complain about how I think it's dumb. I'll try to um, help you understand it as well. Uh, and help it, no, help you understand the connection um, that is being, how do I say, <clears throat> sort of undermined by making the switch to X for a domain variable. All right, so let's say example one, sketch the graphs of each function. We're getting into graphing some transformed trig functions here, or at least sine and cosine. So let's say a f of x equals two plus cosine x. You see what they're doing, right? They're using x as the input instead of t, right? Instead of t and f of t. So <clears throat> what I would like to do is say f of t equals two plus cosine of t. And then when I graph the function, I would call it the curve, like literally the curve of the graph, I would call it f of t, and I would call the vertical axis x, because that is what cosine t is outputting, is an x coordinate, right, uh, on the unit circle. <clears throat> they are using x uh, as their domain variable here though. So what do, we, what do we do here? What do we do here? Two plus cosine X. When you add a two to the outside of a function, you know, let me write this down before I even get into graphing. When we add a two, I'm just gonna say add to the outside of a function. Remember how I said I was going to describe them in layman's terms? Well, here we go. When we add to the outside of the function, we lift it. I mean, that's not very technical, right? But that's okay. That's what we're going to do. We're going to lift the cosine graph by two. So I'm going to sketch a very rough graph of cosine. How do you do this? Because you're going to have to be able to do this by hand. How do you graph a quick sketch of a cosine graph? You plot these half pi values, so pi on two, pi, three pi on two, and two pi. And you may even want to um, go into the negatives a bit. I won't go that far. I'll say negative pi on two and negative pi. And maybe I'll even go a little bit further past two pi. Uh, what's another half pi? It would be uh, five pi on two, right? And then maybe one more, three pi. So I'm going beyond one period here, but that's okay. That's It could be useful, right? So here's cosine. Mm, let me pick my colors here. Oh, wait, 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 wait. 
All right, so I'm doing it how they want us to do it, where this axis is X and this axis they're going to call just Y, just Y. So they're they're assuming we are all dumb and we cannot understand it if, if the coordinate axes are not X and Y, right? <clears throat> So that's kind of the, the assumption they're making um, by, by forcing us to use X as the domain variable. So now we're going to graph F of X, which I'll do um, first. I'll do my cosine graph, right? So I'll do my cosine graph, which I know looks sort of like this. It's bouncing between at each of these half pi values. It's bouncing between one, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, right? So this one will be here. I don't even have to think that hard once I know how it's acting. At each pi on two, it's bouncing between these three values. So here's my sort of general cosine. Now this is not the answer, right? Because I want cosine plus two. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this function by two. So now we're going to lift it up by two. So that means when I draw this new picture, so I'm going to try to line it up here. The same inputs, negative pi on two, negative pi, pi on two, pi, three pi on two, et cetera, et cetera. My graph is not going to bounce between 1, 0, and negative 1 now. It's going to bounce between what? I'm going to add 2 to it, so it's going to be up here at 3. And when I add 2 to that, it's going to bounce between 3 and 1. And with that central value being 2, right? That central value being 2. So my actual graph, which I'll do in green, is going to be starting at the highest value of three, then at each pi on two, now it's going to start bouncing around, right? At pi on two, it's going to be here in the middle and then down here at the extreme. And then the next one, it bounces back up and then back up again. Then it bounces back to the middle and then all the way down at that extreme lowest value. Going the opposite way, it's at the top, bounces to the middle, bounces down, and that's as far as I went there. So it has the same general shape, right? It has the same exact shape as the one above at the same T values. It's just lifted up. It's just lifted up by two. Lifted up by two. <clears throat> okay. And again, these are X and Y values. Well, again, that's just... Really, what we should be calling them is we should be calling this axis T. We should be calling this vertical axis X and this curve F of T. But again, we're we're playing along by their rules and calling, uh, you know, we're going to play along by their rules and graph it as F of X equals cosine of, of X. OK. And if you don't like my picture, you can always go to Desmos and graph um, uh, 2 plus cosine x and see kind of a prettier picture there. All right, let's graph some more. Cosine of negative X. When we negate the outside of a function, we flip it over the X axis, <clears throat> the horizontal axis. 
to be a little bit more general. OK. Uh, dang. OK, so I'm going to graph G of X equals negative cosine X. I know that I should be bouncing between one and negative one. My graph is not lifted or anything like that. Let's say that pi on two, pi, three pi on two and two pi, those same four values. And I'll go two this way. So negative pi on two and negative pi just to have a little bit more. <clears throat> cosine of X would start up here, right? Sort of sort of go down like this, right? But we want to graph negative cosine of x. So I'm going to flip it over the horizontal axis. So originally, the dots would be here, and then here, and then here, here, and here. And going back this way, they would bounce here. So remember, it goes for cosine, you're starting at the top for the base cosine graph, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, right? It's bouncing just like that and then going reverse, middle, bottom, and it would go middle, top if I kept going, right? <clears throat> one, zero, negative one, zero, one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now we're flipping this over the horizontal axis, in this case, the X axis. So this value needs to pop down here now, right? reflecting it over. The zero value is fine. It stays right there. Now this value down here needs to pop up here. This value again, the ones at zero are fine. And then the one up here needs to reflect and be flipped over down there. Going back this way, let's adjust these. So there we go. Now I've effectively, once I connect these red dots, I've reflected my graph or flipped it over the horizontal axis. So I'll say, shoop. Shoop, adding, you know, if they're not straight lines, they should be curved just like that. There's my negative cosine of X graph. It's cosine, but flipped upside down. So we're doing two things here. We're learning about sine and cosine graphs, and we're also recalling these different types of transformations you can do on functions in general. I'll leave that there for one more minute while I write down example C. H of X equals two sine of X. When we multiply a number to the outside of the function, we stretch the function vertically. When the number is bigger than one. If we multiply by a fraction smaller than one, then we're going to shrink the function. We'll look at one of those two separately. So in this case, this is the category we're falling into where the number we're multiplying to the outside of our function is bigger than one. So we're, this is going to be a vertically stretched graph. Ooh. Okay. Again, these input values are going to still be pi on 2, pi, 3 pi on 2, 2 pi. And then I'll go uh, I'll go a full period in reverse. So negative pi on 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi on 2, negative 2 pi. So these are each multiples, half multiples of pi. OK, I'm not labeling them because it just makes the graph look rough, right? But just remember, they are half multiples of pi. <clears throat> 
Now, originally the sine graph is bounded between one and negative one, but now we're stretching it vertically, right? We're stretching it vertically by two. So instead of just going to one or negative one, it's going up to two and negative two. So it's stretched in both directions by two. And that's fine. That all that means is I'm going to draw my sine graph, which norm, it starts at at the middle at zero. Remember, the sine graph starts at zero and then it starts going up. Instead of bouncing between one, zero, negative one, I'm going to bounce between two and then zero, negative two, zero, etc. So starting at zero, bounce up to two. For the a little bit further over, there we go, and then back to zero, and then all the way down to negative two and then back to zero, okay? In the reverse direction, starting at zero, going all the way down to negative two, bouncing up to zero, and then at the next one, bouncing all the way up to two, and then back to zero. So connecting these, oof. Oof, they got a little rough at the end there. And just to really, let you be able to see this. Uh, let me show you one on Desmos. Here's sine of x. Here's sine. Oop. Here's two sine of x. So we see that it is indeed stretched vertically in both directions. Right. It's instead of going from one to neg negative one for those extreme outputs, one to negative one, those Y values are two. Ooh, sorry, two output two to negative two. <clears throat> Stretched vertically and you can see that if I even increase this, maybe, maybe I made this like five, it would be even more stretched or if I made it like 10, then it's even more stretched, right? But it still goes through those same zero points that the original one went through because it's not it has not been shifted up or down or shifted left or right. It's been just yanked up and down like stretched with those zero points maintaining as anchors. All right. For D, E, and F, I think maybe actually we can just go back to Desmos again. Let's look at cos. No, let's look at one half sine of x. So here's sine of x. What do we expect if I put a one half in front of it? Well, if we recall from, let me zoom in a bit. <clears throat> if we recall from uh, bu, 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 what's it called? <laughs> 112, um, then we know that multiplying by a number on the outside of the function when it's less than one squishes the function vertically. So let me label my zero to two pi. There it is. OK, so we see the purple line, which is the one half X is being squished vertically relative to to the to the uh, green sine of x function. I could even make it even closer to zero, like one over 10, and then it's really squished, right? It's like really, really squished. You can almost hardly see, you know, the uh, the curve in the graph. It, it's, you know, if I make it high enough, it starts to look like a straight line, right? So multiplying on the outside of, this would be a good fact to write down, when we multiply a number to the outside of the function, we compress the function vertically when the number is smaller than one. And then let's consider a cosine x graph. I'll say that again when we, as we look at this one, uh, here's two cosine of x. So this is a example of when the number is bigger than one and we're vertically stretching it. <clears throat> and now let's look at a one half. So when we multiply a number to the outside of the function, we stretch the, sorry, we compress the function 
vertically when the number is smaller than one. We're seeing that again with the cosine graph. It's being squished. The red line here is being squished. I could squish it even more too. I could say like one fifth and more squished. Okay, cool. Let's talk about some vocabulary about the shape of a graph, of, a, of these graphs. Consider this form y equals a sine of k x and y equals a cos so again these y's and x's are like meaningless here they don't mean anything about the unit circle anymore so y equals a sine k x and, and y so it's just consider these forms of two function graphs so these represent the curves with some number multiplied on the outside and let, let me just say real quick that um, k should be bigger than zero then the so-called amplitude is whatever the absolute value of a is. So if a is negative three, then its amplitude is three. If a is two, then the amplitude is two. Amplitude is sort of you can think of it like the the height of the graph that's not actually like that's not actually what it is it's actually like a measure of the distance between um distance between the highest point of the wave of the curve uh versus its equilibrium point like its point at zero which is like a lot right that's like a fancy definition but uh that is it, it's not technically just its height um because if i scoot the function up and down then that would mess with the height, right? Amplitude is just going to be whatever that number attached to the front of the function is. That's amplitude, except you make sure it's positive. You always talk about amplitude as a positive number. <clears throat> the period, now remember the period of these functions is 2 pi, right? It's 2 pi. I have not looked at yet um, multiplying by a number inside the function, which is where k is, right? So I haven't like I haven't done any examples of that yet. So let me write down a fact and then we'll do some examples. Is this example is that example one? Yeah. All right. The period of uh, the function graph, well, let's say the graph or the function graph, it's fine, is 2 pi, right? Typically just 2 pi. But if you multiply by a number inside, then the period is 2 pi over k. Why? Well, let's look at some examples. So example two, the same, just sketch, just, just uh, let's just graph each one, graph each function. A, let's let f of x equal sine of 2x. Start with a simple one, sine of 2x. <clears throat> what does multiplying by a number inside the function do? Let me try to use the same verbiage that I did for multiplying outside. When we multiply a number to the inside, when I say the inside of a function, I literally mean like in the input of the sine function. To the inside of a function, we compress there's two, two categories, right? We compress the function horizontally if what? What does it have to do with the number? If the number is 
bigger than one. So it's like opposite to the horizontal case where we stretch if vertically if the number is bigger than one, but here when it's inside, we're compressing horizontally if the number is bigger than one. <clears throat> so when we sketch f of x equals sine of 2x, we should expect it to be squished like an accordion, like an accordion uh, horizontally. So instead of having my input values at pi on 2, pi, 3 pi on 2, and 2 pi, what I'm going to have to do is consider what is the new period of this graph. Well, the period is 2 pi over k, so period here, 2 pi over k, is going to be 2 pi over 2, which is equal to pi. So I'm expecting it to repeat every pi instead of every 2 pi now. OK, it's compressed by ha by 2. It's compressed. So it's only going to be, oh, let me put my outputs here, 1 and negative 1. It's only going to be uh, extending for one period out through pi. So if instead of having a two pi at the end here, I'm just going to have a pi. And if I cut that into four pieces, what is that going to look like? Well, it's going to be pi on four and pi on two and three pi on, you know, just those little quarter measurements. And over here, I'd have negative pi on four, negative two pi on four, which is just pi on two, negative three pi on four and negative pi. <clears throat> And my graph then will just act the same as a sine graph. Now that I've set it up, now that I've got my uh, my x-axis appropriately squished by just having the period range from 0 to pi instead of 0 to 2 pi, and taking those, those intervals here so I know where to bounce between. So now I'm going to bounce up here, and then here, and then back down here and here, just like a typical sine function. And maybe it's hard to see how different this is but I will put one on Desmos for you to see. So you can really see that compression happening. <clears throat> All right. And I'll, I'll come back to my picture as well, but first let's go to Desmos. So here's sine of X. Now here's sine of two X. <clears throat> All right. Sine of X is the blue one. That's sine of x, the blue one. Range, see, there's its period, 0 to 2 pi. But you see, the green one is doing that twice, right? It's got half that period. It starts to repeat 0 to pi. It gets a whole revolution done in 0 to pi because its period is only pi. So if I extend it out to 2 pi, it would do it twice by the time sine is only done it once. So it's taken this blue graph and squished it, squished it. <clears throat> so by the way, how did I find, just real quick, how did I find these values? How did I find, oops, how did I find these values uh, for, for to graph uh, one period when it's got a, you know, because we're used to seeing pi on two, pi, three pi on two, and two pi. Well, I take period divided by four. That's what I did. So pi on four, and then you just count by pi on fours. Pi on four, two pi on four, three pi on four, pi. 4 pi on 4, right, which is pi. Okay, that's how I got those values. All righty, let's look at one where we multiply by, <clears throat> so like a similar one, but this time let's put a 1 half in there instead of a 2. And let's do a cosine graph, cosine of uh, one half x. All right, I want to know the period. So let me take two pi over one half, which we all know that if I'm dividing by one half, that's the same as multiplying by two. So I la-di-da, get four pi, right? 
sending all that fraction nonsense under the rug. And we, we know it should two divided by one half is the same as two times two, getting four pi. OK, so in my graph, I'll go to a new page here. Get, let me get situated here. I'm going to take my period over four to figure out where those increments on the, like what I should be counting by. Why am I dividing by four? Because it hits four extreme values. It goes, you know, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, right? So those are four value. Well, I guess five, but the first one is zero, right? So four beyond zero. <clears throat> that that I need to uh, at the bare minimum to to help me graph sines and cosine functions. So this is what I'm going to be counting by. These are what my where my little tick marks are going to be going to be in intervals of pi. So when I graph this, my amplitude is not changing here. My amplitude is still just one because I'm not multiplying on the outside. And now each of these tick marks now is going to be counting by pi, right? So pi, two pi, three pi. So this one is extended, right? It's extended. We expect, I'll, that. I'll go a whole period this way, two pi, three pi. We, what we expected when we multiplied by something inside the function that's less than one, we expect it to be horizontally stretched. That's exactly what's happening here. A normal cosine graph will just bounce. It'll get a whole revolution done from zero, uh, from t equals zero to two pi, right? It would just, uh, that's all I would need, this little section, zero to two pi to graph uh, a whole revolution. But now in this case, it's been stretched. Its period is not two pi anymore. It's all the way stretched to four pi. So I'm gonna bounce from one, zero, negative one, zero and then back up to one. So there's half of my, or that, that's a full period. I'm gonna graph two periods though. I'm gonna go this way as well, just so we get a, a fuller, you know, a better picture. From one, zero, negative one, zero, back up to one. Okay, there it is. It's been stretched because remember, a normal cosine graph would go like this. It would go from, up here, it would go, I'm thinking, hang on, yes, it would go like this and there, and then go up through here like that. That's one period of a normal cosine graph. But ours has been stretched. Let's go see that in Desmos, since I'm not a great artist. Let's go see that in Desmos. Okay, so here's, oops. Here's a base cosine graph. Now let's put a one half in the input. There it is. <clears throat> so base cosine zero to two pi gets a whole revolution done, whereas the black line cosine of one half x needs all the way out to four pi before it gets a whole revolution done. Okay. Let's practice these ideas. Oh, I gotta get some paper. It's time to buy paper. Okay. <clears throat> Example three find. Find the period at amplitude. Y equals four cosine of three X. Okay, amplitude is just four. That's it, period is going to be 2 pi over 3. OK. Remember back from the A cosine KX, A is amplitude, 
2 pi over k is the period. So this one would be kind of weird to kind of weird to graph. We can do it though. But first, let, let's get this other question down. Y is equal to negative 2 sine of 1 half x. Amplitude is 2, coming from absolute value of this number. Period, well, this is like the one we just did where it's 2 pi over 1 half, which is 4 pi. What would it look like if we graphed that part A? That's a good one to look at because it's kind of weird. If we graphed 4 cosine of 3x, maybe it seems weird because that period is 2 pi over 3. So if I'm looking for my increments on the x-axis, period over 4 would be 2 pi over 3 divided by 4. So 2 pi over 3 divided by 4, which is going to be 2 pi over 12. So pi on 6, that's what the increments on the uh, horizontal axis would be. And by the way, what's the amplitude? It's four. That means my extreme values now are all the way up at four and negative four. So it's a, you know it's going to be steep. And my increments on the x-axis are going to be pi on six. So the first one I'll put here, even though it'd be much, it would be much closer. But just for the sake of being able to see it, there's pi on six, two pi on six, which is pi on three, right? Three pi on six which is just a pi on two, and four pi on six, which is two pi on three. See, there's the period, right? The period is two pi on three. That's where you should be landing at for your last value for a whole period. All right, so, and then I just, now that I've got this all lined up, I just remember that cosine starts up at the top, and then it goes middle, bottom, middle, top, right? So top, then middle, bottom, middle, top. So you see how the amplitude tells you what to put on your y-axis and the period tells you what to put on your x-axis, but the period, there's a bit more going on there, right? You gotta be a little bit more careful. So we would expect this graph to be pretty squished and pretty vertically stretched as well, if we were to graph more of it, which we can tell from this picture that it is pretty, it's pretty squished uh, horizontally because of that three and pretty stretched vertically because of that four. <clears throat> okay, spend the last few minutes talking about horizontal shifting. So we don't have that much to finish on Wednesday for this section. All right, consider y equals a sine of k times x minus b. So this time I'm subtracting something inside the function. That's going to be that horizontal shifting. Oh shoot, I meant to say cosine here. So just two, two of the same thing going on here, just two different, uh, there we go, trig functions. All right, these both have horizontal shift B. Shift. It's like I pointed out before where you can shift the sine graph to be a cosine graph by moving it uh, left by two. Or, yes, that's right. Or shifting the cosine graph right by pi on two. Did I say? I meant pi on two. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> so how do we do this? How can we graph each function? How can we graph something that's been uh, horizontally shifted? So let's say y equals sine of x minus pi on three. All we have to do. Hmm. 
all we have to do is find those new points on the x axis where the uh, the sine function at where it's going to be bouncing between or where, where it's going to be hitting as it bounces between one and negative one. So normally it would start at zero, but negative pi on three or subtracting pi on three means I'm shifting to the right. If you recall from from 112 from precalculus algebra that when you subtract inside a function like this, you're shifting right. So instead of starting at zero zero where the sine function normally starts, I'm going to start here at pi on three. OK. And then the next value is supposed to be pi on two, but instead of that, <clears throat> instead of that, I'm going to be shifting to what is pi on two plus pi on three. That's five pi on six, right? So five pi on six is somewhere here. And then my next value is supposed to be pi, but I want to add pi on three to that. So that would be four pi on three. Just doing, you know, fraction arithmetic. And then, uh, wait a second. What did I say? That was zero pi on two. Yeah, okay. And then pi. Yeah, I'm going to need a longer x-axis. Well, dang it. I'll fix it. OK, so then the next value is 3 pi on 2, and I'm adding pi on 3 to that. Oh my gosh, I messed this up. I think I added pi on 6 to something. Dang it. Let's regraph that. y equals uh, sine of x minus pi on 3. So instead of ranging from, let me say it this way, instead of ranging from 0 to 2 pi for a period, I'm adding, I'm shifting right uh, by pi on 3. In other words, I'm shifting the whole graph right. I'm, I'm adding pi on 3 to those, uh, to those input values. So that's going to be ranging from pi on 3 to 2 pi plus pi on 3 is 7 pi on 3. There we go. Looks like I'm going to run out of time to do the second one, but that's okay. All right, so <clears throat> let's write this down explicitly. Each one, each point, zero, like zero, t equals zero is shifting over, right? Zero turns into pi on three, right? It gets shifted over. And then my next value I would typically pick is pi on two, but it gets shifted um, by pi on three. So that's going to give me five pi over six. Then my next value that I would typically pick is pi, but that's getting shifted by pi on three. So I'm going to four pi on three. OK, the next one is three pi on two that I would normally pick, but that one's getting shifted right by pi on three, just like all the others. So I'm adding pi on three. Each of these arrows, I'm adding pi on three, <coughs> which would give me nine pi on six plus eleven pi on six. Right. And then finally, two pi. Uh, plus pi on three. Let's see. One second. Do, 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 do. Okay. Two pi. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know why I was thinking I messed that one up. Two pi uh, is uh, is uh, six pi on three plus another. Yeah, that's the that's the outer bound. Seven pi on three. There we go. These are the five points that I'm going to have graphed now. So starting at pi on three, which is roughly there, and then my next value. So this is pi on three. My next value is five pi on six. So they're weird. They're weird values, right? They're not where we would normally expect to be graphing. And then four pi on three, but they're all evenly spaced. 
They're all spaced by a pi on two. <clears throat> and then 11 pi on six. And then finally that seven pi on three. All right, so the first one, and remember sine starts at bottom and then goes up and down. So we're going bottom, or uh, uh, starts at the middle and then goes up. So it starts middle then goes up, then down back to the middle, then all the way down and then back to middle. There we go. So we have this sort of shape for the period. So it's the exact same shape. It's just been scooted over by pi on three. Those are a little bit harder to deal with, right? <clears throat> As you can see. So let's look at. Desmos, where is. So you can see this graph. There it is. Mm, sine of x minus pi over pi. OK, there it is shifted over by pi on three and, and just so we see it, there's the original sine graph. So it's been shifted to the right that zero shifted to pi on three. This point up here, uh, wait, where is it? On the original graph, pi on two shifted to five pi on six. Then the next original point, three pi on two shifted to 11 pi on six, et cetera, et cetera. You see the final one, the final one ending at two pi right there, but that shifted right here to seven pi on three. Okay. So next time I will finish talking more about, uh, or I'll talk some more about horizontal shifting, and then we'll put it all together, all these things together, and graph a stretched and shifted uh, trig function. All right, that's all I got today. I'm going to post questions to mark for review in the chat but you guys are good to go.